Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you notice carefully, the mission team is identified. Paul is the leader of the team. He is the apostle that God commissioned to go and start churches. There's a man named, and some of you may have in your Bibles, Sylvanus. Any, anybody have that? Okay. Sylvanus is a Latin form of the Greek word. is an expression of God's riches at Christ's expense. It's unmerited favor. And peace is a sense of complete well-being. It's not just the lack of war, it's complete well-being. Shalom is an Old Testament word. So I think you might be wondering, why would Pastor Tim open up with chapter 1 verse 1 and then just and then just read one verse, and it's, it's quarter to 11, and I'm not quitting yet. What, what's going on here? I'm glad you asked. When we read one of Paul's letters, I want to encourage us to do something that I believe is very important. Go back to the story behind the letter. And if you're going to go back to the story behind the letter, you have to turn with me, and this is our main passage for this morning, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And when we read Acts chapter 17, we find the answer to two questions. First of all, what was the story behind this letter? And secondly, what was it that prompted Paul to write this letter to the Thessalonians? And I'm going to start this morning by reading Acts chapter 17, verse 1 to 10. And remember when it says they in the first verse, it's referring to Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 1. When they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went to the synagogue on three Sabbaths and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus, I, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out up to the crowd. But when, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men are, uh, sorry, yeah, these men 
who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They all they are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and, and the others post bond and let them go. Let me read verse 10 as well. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. That far in the reading of God's word. This morning I want us to consider this church planting venture that only took perhaps two months. First of all, I want you to consider the team's entrance into Thessalonica, verse 1. Paul and his team had been missionaries, and they were going to, from place to place, teaching about Jesus and starting churches. And uh, they had been to several places, and then Paul wanted to go to Ephesus so badly, if we read in Acts chapter uh, 16. But the Holy Spirit of God prompted him not to go to Ephesus, but rather to go to Macedonia. And the key, one of the key cities of Macedonia was Philippi. And God worked in a mar marvelous way, actually in texts that we taught in VBS about the uh, Philippian jailer and how God used him to lead him and his, his whole family to the Lord. But after they became Christians and that church was planted, Paul and Silas kept going on the, the road called the Ignatian Way, and they were going, I believe it was west, in a westward direction, and they went between Philippi and Thessalonica, they crossed these two uh, cities called Amphipolis and Apollonia. So they didn't actually stop there very long, they just went through them. And they were on their way to Thessalonica. Well, what's so big about Thessalonica? Well, Thessalonica was the capital city of Macedonia, the, the lead city of the whole region. And it was a large port city. Now, when I say large, you know, nowadays we think of large cities as being millions of people. In those days, 200,000 was considered a large city. And that's approximately what the scholars estimate that uh, Thessalon Thessalonica had. So, in this large port city of that day, there was a Jewish synagogue. And Paul made it a practice that he would share the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And so Paul, when he came to Thessalonica, he saw that there was a synagogue there. And in order to have a synagogue, you had to have more than 10 Jewish males. That was their rule, their constitution, if you will. And so there were many Jewish people in the city of Thessalonica, and Paul went there first, and it was his heart to share Jesus with the people in Thessalonica. So that is the team's entrance into the city. Second, consider their witness in the Jewish synagogue. He went, uh, Paul went there for three Sabbath days. And that is the, the only time measure that we have. But after that, it seems like he didn't meet, leave immediately. It seems like after that, they started meeting in Jason's house. And most scholars think that if you add the three weeks that he was in the synagogue and the weeks that he met in J they met in Jason's house, it would come to approximately two months. That's a guess from scholars, but that's what most scholars suggest. So he went there, and I want you to notice what he did. He went there to reason with them from the scriptures. 
And what did he reason about? He went to the, by the way, if he's reasoning from the scriptures, what scriptures are he, is he reasoning from? He's not re reasoning from the epistles of Paul because most of them aren't written yet. He's not even reasoning from the Gospels. He's reasoning from the Old Testament. Their scriptures at that time. So he is reasoning to them from the scriptures and he went on to explain to them that the Christ, and don't confuse this at this point specifically with Jesus. He's talking generally the Messiah. Okay? He went on to explain that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now I have a question for you this morning. If you had to prove from the Old Testament that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead, could you do it? And if you could do it, where would you go to show it? I don't know what your answer would be, but my answer would be that I would go to Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely the penalty that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. There were Jews that believed that that referred to the Jewish nation. But Paul probably would have argued that this referred to the Messiah and that Jesus had fulfilled the prophecy about the Messiah to the very letter. So Paul, if, he, if he's doing what I thought he did or if he's doing something from another passage, isn't the big point this morning. The big point is that he took time with the Jewish people to explain to them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead and that the person who came that he claims was the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the one who fit the bill of suffering, dying, and rising from the dead. By the way, later on in Paul's epistles, Paul says that this is the gospel. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and then he rose again. So when he's explaining these things to the Jewish people, basically, he's sharing the gospel with them. That's what he's doing. He's making the main point, the main point. And he went on to tell them, verse 3, that this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah that Israel has been waiting for for a long time. This is Jesus. And that's what he does in the synagogue. Now, verse 4 tells us what happened as a result. People came to believe in Jesus because of Paul's teaching from the scripture. Some of them were Jews. Now it's kind of interesting, I never noticed this before this week. The word for some in this text in Acts is the word that we get tiny from. It means that there was a small amount of Jews. Some of the Jews were persuaded by Paul and Silas. These were Jewish men who were leaders in the synagogue. But compared to the few, the some, that were Jews, there was a large number of God-fearing Greeks. Well, you said, but Paul's been in the synagogue. What's going on here? Well, the Greek people were allowed to listen. They weren't allowed to discuss. They were allowed to be there. And that is true also of the women. And uh, when Paul says, not a, f or when Luke says, not a few prominent women, he's uh, making a understatement. He's saying there were a lot of prominent women who believed. So this is the nucleus of the church in Thessalonica. Some Jews, not many, but some, the, 
a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a large number of prominent women in that area. So, we have the team's entrance to, into Thessalonica, their witness in the Jewish synagogue, the con their converts at the time of this witnessing, but then the rest of the chap uh, this passage involves the opposition of the jealous Jews. If there were only, if he went to the Jews first, and there were only some Jews that believed. What about the other Jews, the majority, the larger number of Jews? Well, we're told about that in verse 5. But the Jews, and this is the majority of the Jews, were jealous. How do you make somebody jealous? You make somebody jealous by giving somebody a present and not giving the other person a present? By giving a person information and withholding it from somebody else, those are ways that we can make people jealous. And the people who believe in Jesus, who accepted Jesus as their Messiah, were so full of joy and enthusiasm and excitement because of their, of their new life in Christ, that the people who were Jewish but just couldn't, couldn't come to understand Jesus the way Paul taught, they thought, huh, why are they so happy? What's got into them? Right? They were jealous. And it, it says they were, they were, that was their motive. And then they had a method. Well, if Paul is being so successful, we're going to stop it. And the way we're going to stop it is we're going out into the city, and every city had a, how could I, how could I say it? Rabble rousers, trouble organizers, uh, terrorists. And these people who were Jewish people from the synagogue cooperated with the, or got the terrorists to cooperate with them and said, I want you to make a big stink. These guys are causing trouble. They have gone all over the world causing trouble, and they've come here too, and they're causing trouble here. So I want you guys to give it to them. Be a huge protest. And uh, like some of the protests I've heard of even today, people are paid to go protest, and they don't even know what they're protesting. They're just <laughs> protesting because they've been paid to protest. That's the kind of concept that we have going on here. And uh, so they formed, the Jewish people formed a mob, and all of a sudden they had a warrant. And the warrant they had was to go into Jason's house because they were searching for Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas were the ones who were preaching Jesus in the synagogue. And Paul and Silas were the ones who, as far as the Jews were considered, concerned, were causing trouble. So they went to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas. But the church must have had word a little bit earlier. Because Paul and Silas could not be found. That the Bible speak for, they hid them. The church was very careful what they did to protect Paul and Silas. But because they were protecting Paul and Silas, the person whose house the church was meeting in was the guy who got in trouble. And that's one of three people we have mentioned in the New Testament who served in the church of Thessalonica. We'll get to the other three later, or two later. But this is a guy named Jason. He was the one who was the person who owned the house where the meeting was, where the church meetings were. And now these, these leaders of the Jews uh, arrested Jason and dragged him out, him and the others, before the crowd. And they made these accusations that I already mentioned before. These men have caused trouble all over the world. 
cause trouble. What have they been doing all over the world? Telling people about Jesus. Do you realize that some people in our world think that when we tell people about Jesus, we're causing trouble? And it happened this week. I heard about it this week. When I heard, uh, it was on several news stations, that Greg Laurie is holding an evangelistic meeting in Anaheim. He's done the same kind of meeting for 29 years in a row, and he took out a billboard ad in a, in a, in a shopping mall, and the billboard ad simply showed Greg Laurie holding a mic to his, his mouth and a Bible up like that. And it invited people to the Harvest Crusade meeting. And you know what happened? The, the mall that had contracted to put up that ad received threatening phone calls. That that was an offensive ad, that they should take the ad down, and they took the ad down and, and they asked Greg Laurie and his group if they would uh, take the Bible out of the ad, take the microphone out of the ad, take a few other things out of the ad, and make it more palatable for people. So Greg Laurie and his group agreed to do that. And they made a generic ad. Still, the mall refused to put it up because they said, that these antagonistic calls were coming fast and furious. By the way, Greg Laurie is a fellow Southern Baptist. This is happening in California. This isn't some political thing. This was simply preaching the gospel. So that, that was, they called that causing trouble all over the world. And what was it that was causing trouble? They are defying Caesar's decrees. Do you know how ironic that is for a Jewish group to say that the reason these people are causing trouble is because they are defying Caesar's decrees? Caesar was not the king of Israel. Caesar was the king of Rome. Or the, the leader of Rome. And for the Jews to have more allegiance to the Roman king than to their king, Jesus, was terribly ironic. They are defying Caesar's decrees, they said. The, and they are saying that there is another king called Jesus. And because the Jewish people of Thessalonica re refused Jesus, they end up supporting a pagan who really did not have anything to do with their faith either. And the crowd and the officials were thrown into turmoil, and they made Jason and others post bond, and they, then they let them go. Verse 10, the, consider the departure of Paul and Silas. The church sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. In conclusion, what do we know about the beginning of the church in Thessalonica? From Acts chapter 17, we know at least three things. First, a church was planted in a very short time. Even if you give it what scholars give it, that whole two-month period, that's an extremely short time for a church to be planted. Wouldn't you agree? Not only that, the church faced major opposition and persecution from its very onset, from the very early days. Some of you may disagree with me, but I believe that it's possible that persecution could come to us here in the United States. It's possible. This church knew what persecution was. And in the sense that this church was planted in a very short time and it faced major persecution, Paul, the apostle, the one who started the church, who, who was laboring to help these people become believers, was not able to stay with them very long. Sometimes we get attached to the people who lead us to Christ, don't we? 
and they become dear to us. And for them to leave our church is a very painful thing because we feel that attachment. Well, just think, in two months of Paul leading all these people to Christ, he had to leave for his life. Then 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 tells us a little bit of the rest of the story. Chapter 3, or 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2 tells us that Paul was so concerned about this young group of believers in Thessalonica, he was so concerned about their well-being that he sent Timothy to check on them. You know what that tells me? Timothy wasn't very well known. Timothy wasn't the guy who spoke in front of the synagogue. Timothy was kind of like the guy who carried the suitcase. <laughs> he was kind of the nobody. And I like what Billy Graham's brother Melvin once said. He said, I just want to be a nobody that's willing to tell anybody that there's somebody who loves them. Isn't that good? That's what Timothy was. And Paul, for that reason, could send Timothy to the church because the church knew who he was and they knew he was connected with Paul, but most of the other people didn't. And Timothy went to check up on them, and then in chapter 3, verse 6, we find that Paul says, Timothy came back to Paul with a positive report about what had happened in Thessalonica. The church is doing well, they're growing, God is working in their midst. And this made Paul exude, uh, exude with thanksgiving and praise to God. And that is what prompted Paul to write the first letter to the Thessalonians. Paul had a passion to encourage young believers. Do we? I hope so. Paul taught the young church to stand in spite of persecution. Will we? I hope so. And in these next few weeks, as I take you part by part through the whole book of 1 Thessalonians, the letter that Paul wrote to this persecuted, tiny, infant church, I want us to learn together how we can grow in Christ, just like the people in the Thessalonians, in the Thessalonica did. And I invite you to join me on the journey. We'll be on this journey all the way through the fall. And I hope that you will work, it, work through it with me. The first thing you can do to work through it with me is that you could read. It's only five chapters. You could read the whole book of First Thessalonians all by yourself. <laughs> and if you read that whole letter all by yourself, next week when I start to teach on chapter 1, verse 2 to 10, you'll be ready to hear God's word. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us this record.